Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yuka Ishikawa. I'm the program manager for education and public awareness at the, the People with Disabilities Foundation, one of the co-sponsors of this seminar. I'm pleased to be the master of ceremonies for today's seminar entitled Multiculturalism and Psychiatric Disabilities, including values to effective treatment and the impact of cultural norms in recognizing, diagnosing psychiatric disabilities. Today's seminar is co-sponsored by the People with Disabilities Foundation and the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. I would like to thank the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum for making this seminar possible. I'd also like to acknowledge one of the board members of the People with Disabilities Foundation, Sally Scar. Sally is attending the seminar today. We have two sign language interpreters whose names are Joseph Cartwright and Greg Heritus. Today, we will discuss two main issues, which are psychiatric disabilities and cultural diversity. Disabilities are not uncommon, but invisible. According to 2003 data from the Social Security Administration's Regional Commissioner's Office, 28.3% of individuals with disabilities in this region have psychiatric disabilities, and disabilities not counting retardation as opposed to physical disabilities. Immigration to California in recent years has been unprecedented, cre creating one of the most multicultural states in the United States. Between 1960 and 1995, the number of immigrants living in the state increased sixfold, from 1.3 million to 8 million and tripled as a percentage of the state's population from 8.2% to 24.1%. Relative to the rest of the county, count, country, growth in California's immigrant population has been just as dramatic. In 1960, California had 8.8% of the nation's total population and was home to 13.9% of its immigrants. By 1995, California accounted for 12.1% of the country's population and 32.7% of the nation's immigrants. Obviously, um, multicultural and multi-ethnic America is our everyday reality here in California. At today's seminar, we have two guest speakers, presentations in the first hour, which will identify challenges on the two issues. After a 10 minutes break, we will have an open discussion session for another hour to discuss what we need to do to solve identified problems. At this time, I'd like to ask Stephen Bruce the executive director of the People with Disabilities Foundation to make a few welcome words. Thank you, Yuka, and good afternoon. Um, I'd like to say that People with Disabilities Foundation began operations approximately six years ago in, in, on June 22, 2000, um, with a mission of uh, integrating people with psychiatric disabilities into the whole of society. We do have two program components, advocacy, which is hands-on, um, including ADA employment and social security, and education. Uh, this is our seventh multi-hour seminar. The last seminar was entitled uh, Healthcare Issues for Individuals with Psychiatric and or developmental disabilities with a focus on emergency room triage. In other words, referral and assessment when an individual uh, goes through the emergency room triage 
uh, process. Um, this um, seminar does um, flow from that uh, seminar in that it does involve uh, access to uh, health care. Um, whether an individual is from uh, Hong Kong, Nicaragua, Cambodia, um, they have the same right under our laws, in particular Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, to, to equal access for, to health um, programs and services given certain conditions, such as receipt of federal uh, funds. Um, it is important to note, and, and our speakers will discuss this in more detail, um, that there are obstacles to diagnosis and treatment. Some of them are language, and some of them are based on different cultural backgrounds. Uh, Here's a definition of culture. The, I'm not going to read this, but it's a pattern of human belief and behavior that includes everything about a person that's based on their racial, ethnic, religious, social, or other group. Now, that's obvious. What's not obvious is that there's sometimes a fine line between what is a matter of culture and what is a matter of something else about a person. As an example, um, a colleague of mine told me about uh, a little boy that she represented. He was, a, uh, he was an African-American kid from Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco, and he kept being late to his therapy appointments because there was shooting going on in his neighborhood. And he would tell this to his therapist who, um, was from the suburbs and didn't really understand this, and the therapist thought he was lying. And that had a big effect on the way the therapy went, which was nowhere. And th the sad end of the story is the boy ended up being shot and killed. Now, question whether the fact that the therapist should have been sensitive to this about the boy was a question of the boy's culture. I think you could argue that it is. Um, even though it might not be direct, it's more linked to his economic status than to his um, ethnic background, but it's definitely something that the clinician should have been attuned to. And competence, obviously, is having the capaci capacity to function effectively. So I'm going to kind of race through these slides. A culturally competent organization is one that values cultural diversity and is sensitive to it as well. It's not just that you understand it, but that you actually care about it and you want to embrace it. And then um, expanding the knowledge that that brings to an organization and adapts its services to meet that diversity. And then culturally competent service providers, more cute children in the pictures. Um, Learn as much as they can about the individual's culture, but also recognize the influence of their own background on the services they provide. Um, I think it's really important to understand that cultural identity does not take the place of someone's individual identity. It's very easy when you're being culturally sensitive to stereotype. And there's a fine line between being culturally sensitive to someone's background and applying a stereotype to them. Um, so it's important when you're working with an individual to integrate what that person articulates about their own needs and preferences and abilities with what they might not articulate about their cultural ba uh, background. Whoops. Oh, sorry. Cultural competency um, is made up of linguistic competency and other types of cultural competencies. Um, it, linguistic competence and competence and competency are the same thing, is the ability to communicate in a manner that's easily understood by everyone. We talk about people who are ling limited English proficient or LEP. That's generally defined as someone who speaks or understands English less than very well. Um, and that may be people who are coming from another background, uh, another language. It may also be people who are simply um, less than fully literate because of a learning disability or they're just they never learned how to read. That economic, it could be economic reasons why they never learned to read. Um, it also may be because of a disability. The other parts of cultural competence include, you know, people's communication styles, people's attitudes toward mental illness, some of the things that um, you could talk about. Um, 
a big one. I, I, practice, I uh, did human rights research in Japan for two years, and a big issue there was informed consent. And our ideas of informed consent are very, very different than what they were in Japan at the time, and even still what they are in Japan. And uh, issues of um, Americans see informed consent very differently than s people in some other cultures. All right, this isn't actually supposed to be in this presentation. <laughs> but improved outcomes are good. <laughs> this is left over from the other one. Oh, it is, okay. Um, these are reasons why it's important to be culturally competent. Let me just see if my slide actually got in here. Nope, all right, that's all right. Strange. Um, two reasons why we should care about cultural competency. One is, uh, improved outcomes. It obviously leads to better diagnosis, earlier diagnosis, better information, um, better informed consent, better what I, I hate this term, but patient compliance. Um, patients are able to do what they're told by their providers to do better. Um, and uh, decreased liability for service providers because all those things are better. Uh, providers sometimes focus on the costs of complying with linguistic and culturally competent uh, requirements. And I think it's also important that we focus on the costs of non-compliance. Because um, from a provider's perspective, it may sound like um, a cost in time or energy or money to provide an interpreter for someone. But if you look at the cost of not providing that interpreter, the economic cost as well as the cost in terms of the outcome that is achieved um, can be substantially higher. So we'll start with federal laws on um, this in this area. The big one is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is the text, no person in the United States shall, on the grounds of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That's section one of Title VI. Uh, I'm sorry, section 601. Section 602 gives, the, gives federal agencies um, the authority and the obligation to issue rules and regulations and orders to carry out this provision. Um, almost everyone is covered by Title VI um, because federal funding of health care is almost universal. There's some question about people who only accept medical, Medicare Part B but uh, we really don't want to get into that and um, let's just leave it that almost everyone is covered. <laughs> What Title VI does is it requires linguistic accessibility. Um, it's enforced by the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Health and Human Services, or, or OCR. Um, and it's very clear that OCR is there to interpret and enforce the, uh, Title VI as it requires linguistic accessibility among, uh, uh, in, among other things, healthcare programs. Um, it's unclear whether Title VI actually covers more than linguistic uh, competency in terms of cultural competency. Uh, at this point, it's hard to say that it's been interpreted that way. It really hasn't been interpreted that way. Um, but I think it could be if we wanted it to be. Um, These are um, some of the regulations. Federal Medicaid regulations um, require Medicaid providers to uh, render culturally and linguistically appropriate services. You know what happened <laughs> is that I think I sent Yuka the wrong PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I think I sent her the original that mine was based on. on I'm sorry about that. Um, 
that's okay. Everything you've seen up to now is accurate and everything. <laughs> I'm just going to have to fill in a little bit. Um, Title VI includes um, both intentional and what's called disparate impact um, discrimination. That means uh, not only discrimination that's intentionally done, but also uh, people being treated differently because of their race or national origin or whatever. Um, there was a Supreme Court case in 2001 called Alexander versus Sandoval, which held that there's no private right of action. In other words, individuals cannot privately go to court to enforce a disparate impact claim under Title VI. And that was a, a big, uh, that was a big deal because it means you can't go to court and say this provider did not give me um, uh, the appropriate uh, interpreting or translation services uh, that are required under Title VI unless you can show that it's intentional. And it's very, very difficult to show that something like that is intentional. So we're operating now in a landscape where OCR is Tried, is enforcing this law, but we can't go to court independently to, to do it unless we can show that it's intentional discrimination. Mm. Um, and then here, these are some other uh, federal laws that also cover linguistic accessibility and cultural competency. Um, HICFA is the agency that oversees the Medicaid program, and there are all kinds of Medicaid rules that require linguistic and cultural accessibility and cultural competency as well. This is um, related to kids. Um, the class standards, the national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services and health care, um, are issued by, or were issued by the um, Office of Minority Health of HHS, HHS, and they're used for lots of purposes, including um, JCO, the Joint uh, Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. Um, they use that standard when they are accrediting hospitals and other healthcare organizations, and they um, talk specifically about language access, but they also do talk a lot more than Title VI about culturally competent care in ways that go beyond linguistic access. Um, their guidelines, their recommendations, they're not legally enforceable. But because they're used by accrediting organizations, um, they do have a great deal of impact into what healthcare organizations do. Um, now we're into California. Um, Oh, and before we get to this, I'm going to give you um, just a little bit about um, what the landscape is in California. In 2000, we had um, a bill called AB 2394 that established a uh, task force on culturally and linguistically competent physicians and dentists. And um, Susanna G., one of the staff, uh, a staff attorney in, in PAI's Sacramento office, was one of the members of that task force. We have, uh, as handouts, a couple of the reports from uh, the task force report and one working group report from that task force which set forth a lot of what I've been talking about, about what is culturally competent uh, health care, including mental health care, but it covers all health care, and um, also summarizes some of the laws that we'll be talking about. Um, at about that time, 1999 and 2000, is when California started focusing on this issue and started passing all kinds of laws and regulations and Medi-Cal rules that require cultural competency. We're way beyond most, maybe all other states in this area in terms of what we've generated legislatively to protect people in this area. That's great and that's the good news, okay? The bad news is that it hasn't been enforced a whole lot yet, and we haven't really got to the point where um, we have a well-developed case law or really much case law at all on this. So I, I think it's important to recognize this as a new area of law and um, think about sort of where, where we can take it from here. I'm going to tell you about some of the laws, um, and I think We'll see what we can do with this PowerPoint. I'll make my real PowerPoint available to Yuka um, so you can get the real slides. I apologize again for that. Um, 
this is mental, uh, California Medi-Cal managed care regulations. Um, county mental health plans have to have culturally, uh, plans for culturally competent care. And actually, if, whoops. I just hit something. Um, if, there are, if there are copies of this presentation out there, I recommend that you take them too, because some of the stuff that has to do with children and youth I didn't put in mind. So if you have both, then you'll have extra. This is just the Department of Mental Health's responsibility in um, making sure the county mental health plans develop the plans that they're supposed to develop. How am I doing on time, Henry? Maybe about five minutes. Okay. I'm going to skip over some of these because I'm getting short on time. Um, this Bilingual Services Act is an important California law that um, applies to every state agency except for the insurance agency and local public agencies um, that are uh, involved in furnishing services to people or having contact with people, um, a substantial number of whom are non-English speaking or limited English uh, proficient. Um, and uh, really what it requires is um, assessments of who the population is and what services are needed. Um, as well as translation of materials, uh, what are called like vital materials, um, into languages that, for which there's a substantial number of uh, uh, patients who speak those languages, um, and then the ability to interpret other um, documents or documents into other languages whenever it's needed. Oh, the, and the, the, I want to go back to, the, to Title VI for a second because I missed this in the PowerPoint that's here. Um, when OCR um, enforces the uh, Title VI, it goes by a four-step, um, a four-factor balancing test. So the rule is not that every language has to be interpreted to every individual who walks in. It's a balancing act that OCR will apply that's based on how many people are um, in that person's um, practice or potentially in that person's practice who speak the language, what, the, what resources are available to the provider, and at what cost to provide interpretation services or translation services. So for example, if that person has, is a part of a um, managed care plan that's required, or a Medicaid plan that's required, otherwise required to provide the interpretation services and pay for it, then the provider doesn't have an excuse not to. So it's really, it's a balancing um, type of a test. And we can talk more about that um, in the discussion part if you're interested in that. Um, we also have um, a couple of civil rights acts in California, the Unruh Act and also um, Government Code um, 111.35, which um, uh, do allow private rights of action um, in discrimination based on race, national origin, and ethnic group identification, color. Uh, they're similar to Title VI, but they explicitly do provide a private right of action. Now, these acts are not, uh, have not really been used in this context, and we can talk more about that later too, but that's, um, if we're looking for legal avenues for enforcing these rights, um, because there's no private right of action under Title VI, we may want to start looking at state law that does provide a private right of action. Um, there are other state laws like the COP Act, which applies to acute care hospitals, um, and some other acts that um, laws that apply to specific types of situations. So we do have a lot of law in this area, and I won't bore you with any more of it. Sorry, don't watch this, you'll get dizzy. The Mental Health Services Act also, uh, Proposition 63, which uh, took tax money to 
try to develop innovative mental health systems of care also has requirements for um, county mental health plans being uh, having linguistic and cultural um, accessibility components to them. Juvenile court, we're not going to worry about that. The Indian Child Welfare Act is a little beyond my scope. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. Anyone who's interested in children will definitely want to get a copy of this particular PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, advocacy tips. Um, these are advocacy tips specifically having to do with children. But um, if you're working with the Medi-Cal system, there are ways to um, file grievances under Medi-Cal. The information is actually both in this PowerPoint and in the one that I meant to give you um, as to how to file a Medi-Cal grievance. Um, also just requesting a new provider, um, informally complaining. And then um, information about how to, um, if, you, if you go to look at your county's mental health plan and see whether it's in compliance with the rules about what, what counties have to provide, this is how you complain if your county isn't complying. Um, again, more information that's in both sets of handouts. Uh, this is the OCR information for making a complaint. I want to stress, I really think it is important to file complaints with OCR. Um, it does take a long time. It is not necessarily going to get you what you want right now. It can take a couple years for an OCR complaint to go through. A year is fast. So it's really not the way you're going to get your services that you need now. What it does do, though, is put the provider on notice that you're complaining about the, a problem in a really concrete way. It also is important for data collection. Because this is still a relatively new area of law, it's really important that OCR knows how many problems are out there. Um, and also, OCR will, it, it's important for OCR to have complaints to, uh, what they do is they negotiate or uh, negotiate with the providers to try to get something worked out. That's their goal. They don't, um, as to my knowledge, they never have taken away federal funding from an agency that's not in compliance or, or a provider that's not in compliance with Title VI, although they have that authority to. But they do work out agreements. And again, it can take some time, but it's an important function. Um, you can make complaints to the state licensing boards. Um, and then I have some website information at the end here. Um, there's a website that is not in either of these materials that's important to know about, and that's NHELP, the National Health Law Program, www.healthlaw.org. They have a really good um, manual called Ensuring Linguistic Access, and I would recommend if you have any questions about this, they're a great uh, resource. So I, I think I need to wrap up. Um, in terms of advocacy tips, the most important thing I can say is that um, it's important to work directly with providers. And I think it's important to work directly with providers by, by, by articulating the legal requirements. It's important to know what your rights are and to tell the provider, but it's more important to explain to the provider why it's not in the provider's best interest, as well as your own, to provide you with incompetent care. Because if you are not able to understand what the provider's telling you and the provider is not able to understand what you're telling them, the provider is going, to, it's, obviously, it's obvious that you're not going to get good care, but it's also putting the provider, um, number one, to a lot of trouble, and number two, at the risk of um, malpractice. So um, I'll be, uh, my time's up, but I'll be happy to talk more about this later. Thanks.